if, rather, it is an exchange mechanism, an artificial exchange mechanism backed by gold, where countries have access to the pot in relation to the gold that they contributed, uh, and if the BRICS is only meant to settle uh, trade balances, then it's a viable option. And then you do begin to chip away at the exorbitant privilege, as it's called, that the U.S. enjoys uh, by being the world's reserve currency and having uh, the best counterfeit rights uh, of any nation on the planet. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for July 17th through July 24th, 2023, while supplies last. And on this one, supplies may not last long. Because this week we feature 2023 American Silver Eagles at just $9.49 over spot, our lowest price on Silver Eagles in more than a year. Since its first release almost 40 years ago, the Silver Eagle has been, without exception, the world's most popular bullion coin, which provides unparalleled recognizability and liquidity. It's 3 nines fine, comes 20 to a tube, 500 to a box, and is available at just $9.49 over spot while supplies last. Finally, the Silver Eagle is IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always privileged to have this widely followed returning guest. Rick Rule, the former CEO of Sprott Asset Management, is now the CEO of Rule Investment Media. He joins us this Wednesday, July 19th, 2023. Rick, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Donegan, as I've said before, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. We didn't know we'd get an opportunity to speak again so soon, but with the conference, the Rural Symposium on Natural Resource Investing in Boca Raton, Florida, only days away, I wanted to make sure people got one more chance to hear about the uh, remote virtual option that people can make themselves available of. And folks, if you look in the description of this video, you'll see a link that allow you to enroll for that virtual 100% uh, remote option that you can get uh, access to the, the upcoming a rural Investment Symposium on Natural Resources. So we have a lot of questions that were submitted by viewers uh, on short notice here, which is not surprising to me. They jump at the chance. Um, there's a uh, there's a questions here on various aspects about uh, the precious metals markets in particular, battle bank questions. Um, there's questions about the U.S. debt. You've talked to us about that. And uh, one of the questions is something you've dealt with before but it keeps coming up uh perpetual or peter peter pumpkin eater 6966 is asking what is going to be the catalyst for the dollar dropping into the low 90s will it be fairly rapid or a quick drop from here will it be fairly rapid or a quick drop from here you've talked to us about the strength of the relative strength of the dollar what that has to do with markets uh could you zero in on that for the moment for people who are concerned about well, a lot of aspects of that they're concerned about the value of the purchasing power of their savings they're also watching for opportunities to step in and and find do some bargain hunting as investors but you watch that closely can you give us your thoughts on it again well certainly i think if you're talking about the value of the u.s dollar you need to say compared to what uh the u.s dollar is uh the world's reserve currency and i suspect it will continue to be albeit less important the world's reserve currency for the rest of my life so when you talk about pricing the dollar, what are you pricing it in? I continue to believe that the price of the dollar measured in gold terms will begin to fall. But I think that the, the dollar measured in yen or yuan or euros or great British pounds or Mexican pesos will continue to be strong. Uh, uh, a uh, more interesting part of the question, I guess, is uh, uh, Americans purchasing power. Uh, stored in U.S. dollars. I suspect that is in inexorable decline, albeit slow decline. But Dunnigan, you've heard me say before that despite the fact that my purchasing power held in short-term U.S. dollar-denominated instruments cost me purchasing power, I continue to maintain liquidity 
because I believe that the diminution of purchasing power on my liquidity is an option premium to have enough cash to get me through uh, a liquidity decline, uh, however and whenever that may occur. I, I think we're in an interesting position, if you will, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea uh, in terms of most U.S. investors and most U.S. consumers, given that they live a life denominated in the U.S. dollar, uh, and, and given that many of their compatriots uh, are overly indebted and run some risk in a liquidity squeeze, I think people who live U.S. dollar denominated lives need to maintain some U.S. dollar liquidity. Please, in short-term instruments, not long-term instruments, and by short-term, I mean 12 months or quicker. Uh, please, too, if you have excess liquidity, store some of it in gold. Uh, I consider gold to be volatile, but good liquidity. Uh, and that portion that you hold in gold, provided that you're willing to sell it uh, and use it as liquidity when other things become priced more cheaply, is one form of liquidity that perhaps protects you from any impending weakness in the U.S. dollar. Note that I am not one of those who believes that the U.S. dollar will get precipitously worse uh, than other currencies. Uh, I believe, to the contrary, that despite all its faults, uh, to paraphrase Doug Casey, the U.S. dollar is still the prettiest mare, albeit at the slaughterhouse. I'll follow on with uh, another viewer's question as long as we're talking about the U.S. dollar. Original Intent 6916 asks, which poses a, a realistic and bigger existential threat to the U.S. dollar, CBDCs or the BRICS commodity-backed currency? Uh, I, I would have to say neither. Uh, I mean, obviously, the U.S. government would like a central bank digital currency that was called the dollar. They would obviously like the ability to issue currency with the stroke of a pen, which they do now through quantitative easing. But I think they particularly like the idea that they could cancel that currency. Apparently, the technology is now built in so that if they don't like the way that you talk or post or act, uh, they can cancel your savings. Uh, 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 an alternative that they don't have available to them with cash. I don't see that as a threat to the U.S. dollar. I see it as a threat to the U.S. citizenry, which they seem to care less uh, about. As for the uh, <clears throat> the BRICS currency, I, I need to say that as a real currency, as a competitor to the U.S. dollar, uh, in terms of facilitating things like buying a candy bar in Santiago, Chile, uh, or even buying a car in Sydney, Australia, that the BRICS currency is no threat whatsoever. Uh, to the extent that the BRICS nations uh, used a, an alternative currency really to replace the SWIFT banking system, where they had drawing rights to settle international trade credit and debits between themselves, uh, and, and they had the uh, ability to have a call on the gold that had been contributed to the counterparty, now, that is a viable idea. Repeat, there is not enough gold in the BRICS countries to back a currency that was used to run their entire economy. There may well be enough gold in the system, however, in those countries to uh, act as a store of value and an exchange mechanism for trade surpluses and trade debits between fairly small economies. Uh, so when people talk about the BRICS as a currency replacing the U.S. dollar, it's only really viable as a wholesale trade mechanism. Uh, it isn't viable as a currency. If you think about the float of currency that is necessary to run very large economies like China's uh, or an amalgam uh, of 20 economies, there isn't enough gold to back that currency. So if they are going to have it as a common currency, a real currency, you're going to have a gold denominated currency, not a gold backed currency. If rather it is an exchange mechanism, an artificial exchange mechanism backed by gold where countries have access to the pot in relation to the gold that they contributed, 
Uh, and if the BRICS is only meant to settle uh, trade balances, then it's a viable option. And then you do begin to chip away at the exorbitant privilege, as it's called, that the U.S. enjoys uh, by being the world's reserve currency and having uh, the best counterfeit rights uh, of any nation on the planet. There are several questions uh, about stocks of mining companies. Not surprisingly, where you're, you're legendary for your uh, knowledge in that area. This one is very general in nature. I thought we'd start there. Wolfgang Wust 5883 asks, if Rick is convinced of a company's quality and value, does he buy the stock regardless of its current price or wait for a dip? Will he buy in tranches or all at once? I definitely will buy in tranches. If I think the company is a bargain, I'll buy it, irrespective of where I think the market might be going. Warren Buffett uh, has postulated that you shouldn't buy uh, any stock if you wouldn't be willing to own a fraction of that business uh, if the market's closed for five years. And while I don't quite have Buffett's intellect or his courage, uh, I sort of subscribe to that. And certainly, I take a position in a company with the view that if the news continues to be as good as I'm hoping it will be, that I will scale up my position. Uh, I've talked on your show before, uh, Dunnigan, about uh, the postulation that stocks go up because you answer a series of unanswered questions. And to the extent that the answer to those questions are good, my estimates of the value goes up. So, of course, my position will go up uh, if I'm right. Related question here from John's 5256 about valuation of companies, but it's it's related to their performance that they report. Almost no precious metal miners report per share metrics other than earnings per share, EPS. Any miner can use millions of shares to raise capital and spend inefficiently to increase production or to acquire a producing mine, either way to report, quote, record production, which conceals true dilutive results and negative returns on capital invested. Incremental versus dilutive results while management hope, team hopes for a higher precious metals price to hide their poor execution. Your thoughts? I would refer the questioner to Endeavor Mining, uh, who in fact does provide in notes to the financials uh, relevant performance criterion on a per share basis. The fact, though, that I can only pull one company <laughs> out of my head uh, makes the questioner's point. Uh, the metric that matters to business owners is the per share metric, uh, which is to say, on a see-through basis, the performance attributable to the ownership stake uh, of each individual investor. Too often, as the questioner points out, the companies uh, report results on an aggregate basis, which doesn't take into account uh, share issuances, which if they occurred by a government, would be called inflation or debasement. We've got one more that's still general than a couple that are very specific. Uh, Sam Trader 7590 asks, where is the new North American and European demand going to come from to propel uranium metal and miners further into a bull market? Uh, I'm not sure that the demand that matters will be North American or European. Uh, certainly, uh, to answer the question, uh, there has been a complete turnaround in political sentiment in the United States. Uh, and, and for that matter, Canada. Uh, Canada recently restarted part of the Bruce Complex, which is the first major restart in Canada in some time. And the Biden administration, uh, backtracking on intentions to ban nuclear, has decided that they're going to subsidize it, uh, which suggests that there is a turnaround in sentiment in the United States. The French, too, in Europe, uh, and the Swedes and the Finns, for that matter, have talked about fairly aggressive new plant construction although we haven't seen any of them financed. What matters, however, in the uranium business uh, in the very, very near term is the pace of Japanese restarts, which has suddenly become popular with the Japanese people, and the continued massive investments in the People's Republic of China uh, in terms of new builds. Uh, the truth is that while American demand is important to Americans, uh, American demand on a global basis is much less important than it used to be. Uh, the nuclear industry, in fact, the drive for uh, new sources of inexpensive baseload power, particularly new sources of baseload power that don't generate uh, airborne pollution, 
which is to say carbon, is very high, and it's a global phenomenon. The United States is in the enviable position of having a relatively stable and relatively well-supplied grid. Other parts of the world are much less fortunate, and the consequence of that is that they are investing mightily to become in the future where we are today. This one uh, has been on the mind of a lot of our viewers uh, when it comes to potential for nationalization or basically declarations of uh, strategic metals or whatever by different governments that might suddenly flip their private property rights for for shareholders, etc. I'm trying to consolidate this down into a short question, but basically for metals such as gold and silver that are considered strategic because uh, they are used by defense, et cetera, uh, what risks, jurisdictional risk or of nationalization or breached contracts do you see uh, in host governments, specific countries where maybe the highest and lowest risk areas uh, that come to mind for you? I don't see gold and silver's utilization in strategic industries as being a likely source of nationalization. Uh, I see in frontier and emerging markets a a much simpler motive, which is to say greed. Uh, We saw after the commodities run up in the 1970s, a wave of nationalization around the world, oil and gas assets, as an example, uh, in Uh, Chile and Peru and Zambia and Congo, a nationalization of the copper assets. And in most countries, it worked out very poorly. But those lessons haven't been particularly learned. Remember that uh, the job of a government is to steal. Uh, It's to take money or assets from one set of constituencies and deliver it to a different sort of constituency. With regards to the United States, the frequently held concern that I hear that the United States is going to repeat the Roosevelt mistake uh, and nationalize gold, I don't think that'll happen simply because that form of theft isn't popular. The government can steal from you through taxation. The government can steal from you for from you through quantitative easing or counterfeiting, as I would call it. The government can steal from you by manipulating interest rates lower so that you lose the purchasing power as a saver with bank deposits uh, and owning government securities. And all of those forces, forms of theft are very popular with voters. They love to be stolen from incrementally by their government. The idea that the government would run the risk of stealing your IRA or stealing your gold overtly, which would be very unpopular, uh, rather than stealing your wealth through taxation and inflation, which makes them very popular, seems to me uh, like a circumstance that has a a very poor chance of occurring. The next uh, set of questions has to do with banking. That's your fault since you brought up uh, that you're starting a bank. So I'll go ahead and there's about three of them here. Uh, One is just sort of a how does this work and maybe give people a scale or understanding of it. It's a very specific question, but it's general. Uh, Chris54321 says, if silver is at $25 an ounce and someone has 1,000 ounces to put up as collateral, how much would Battle Bank loan that person? Think of Battle Bank's precious metals facility as a margin loan. Uh, it would be a 365-day facility, uh, and we would value the silver on the day that we executed the facility, and we would lend, we would have a borrowing base of 50% of the market value of the silver. So if you assume that the holder had 1,000 ounces of silver at $25 an ounce, the borrowing base would be $25,000, and we would loan $12,500 against it. Similar to a margin loan, if the price of silver declined precipitously uh, so that our loan to value ratio was as high as 70 percent, we would give the holder 72 hours to make additional deposits into the uh, account to skate the account uh, offside. In the event of a 50% decline in the silver price, or where our loan to value uh, uh, exceeded 90%, we would, like any other margin account, sell the account out, uh, reclaim the capital for our loan, and send the balance, if any, to the customer. Note that the borrowing base is reset like most other loans of this type, every 12 months. So the borrowing base goes up or down every 12 months, depending on the metals price. 
And this one is even more general. Uh, Justin Picker, 1755 says, can you explain how credit unions differ from banks in how they operate? And are credit unions a safer alternative to banks? Failure from cashing out low rate bonds to pay depositors with result in realized losses. One of the differences between a credit union and a bank uh, is that the credit union is a cooperative and owned by its members. And any operating surplus uh, above the amount that the institution feels is necessary to grow the institution or to shore up the balance sheet, the institution's own balance sheet, is distributed to its owners, uh, which is to say its depositors. So think of it as a cooperative. Uh, banks are much more commonly uh, shareholder owned. Uh, I think that it is more likely, and I'm making this next part up, that uh, banks are more profit driven and the credit unions are more service driven. The bad news associated with that is that the banks are often much more innovative <laughs> uh, and credit unions are often much more conservative. But the truth is that credit unions, just like banks, have from time to time got themselves in terrible trouble, uh, generally through one of two faults. They either underwrote loans very poorly, perhaps in a well-intentioned way to assist their owners who are both depositors and borrowers. Uh, that's a different way of saying they made dumb loans, uh, perhaps for good purposes. But more commonly in credit unions, uh, the problem has come from a funding mismatch, which is to say that the loans that the credit union makes are very often funded by overnight deposits that can be taken out of the bank very, very quickly and have very volatile interest rate structures, while the asset side of the uh, credit union uh, balance sheet is often in longer denominated assets. If you have an average duration uh, on a credit union, let's say that your average, let's say that your most of your product is in first and second mortgages uh, on real estate owned by the members. And let's say, just for argument's sake, that the median duration of your portfolio is 15 years uh, and it's in fixed rate obligations. If the interest rate goes up, the net present value of those assets falls, just like any bond falls in price as the interest rate of competing obligations rises, while at the same time, uh, your you have no security with regards to your deposits. So if the overnight rate increases, your cost of funds uh, increases. And if as a consequence uh, of borrowers' concern about the deterioration in quality of the assets, people begin to withdraw savings, you just saw what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. You just saw what happened to First Republic Bank. And if your older listeners need more reinforcement, remember that this duration mismatch is what obliterated the U.S. savings and loan business. I wanted to, before we let you go, give us a chance to remind our viewers that this weekend, starting Sunday night and going through Thursday, is going to be the Rural Investment uh, Symposium on Natural Resources. And although it is being held in Boca Raton, Florida, even those who haven't uh, aren't able to travel or hadn't made travel plans can still take part uh, remotely and not just tied to these specific days, but have flexibility of access over coming months. So can you let everybody know how they can, uh, why that they would uh, want to take advantage of that? And I'll let them remind them that they should look in the description of this video for a link to go ahead and sign up for a remote access. Well, first of all, I would suggest that anybody who has the ability to come physically do it. I'm reliably informed that there will be live sightings of Dunnigan Kaiser at the conference, and I uh, advise his listeners to take advantage of that. But assuming that one can't at this late date make arrangements to come to Boca Raton, Florida, I understand. And as a consequence of that, we will live stream the conference so that you can watch the conference uh, from the convenience of your own home. Uh, and if you attend either virtually or physically, you will be able to review the contents uh, of the conference for six months. And this is important. Uh, it is impossible to absorb all of the programming that we're going to throw at you in four days in four days. Uh, while I encourage you to watch as much as is possible and absorb as much as is possible during the conference, it's imperative that you revisit the lessons that you learn in the conference and revisit them frequently for the six months that the conference will be posted live. 
what will this content be? Well, we will have wonderful, wonderful big picture thinkers, people who talk about the world Dunnigan, in the way that you and I think of the world, not in the way that the big thinkers, uh, or for that matter, CNBC uh, or NBC or CBS or even Fox, uh, view it. Uh, Daniela DiMartino Booth, uh, Nomi Prince, Jim Rickards, Bill Bonner, Grant Williams, wonderful people who have a contrarian libertarian view uh, of the way that the world actually works. And if you uh, agree with that worldview, and I suspect that most of your subscribers to one degree or another do agree with that point of view, uh, we will have analysts and uh, portfolio managers that have three and four decades of experience in natural resource markets, people who can tell you how to invest around the circumstances that confront us and people whose success has been tested through bull markets and bear markets through decades. Importantly, uh, Donegan, my favorite feature, I think, is the living legends. Uh, we will have uh, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch talking about how they did it, what you do in a bull market, what you do in a bear market. Uh, these experiences have made them very good investors and learning the lessons can make you a good investor too. Another thing, Dunnigan, uh, at most conferences, the qualification to be an exhibitor is merely a check that cashes <laughs> and a willingness to appear. At our conference, our attendees have told us that our exhibitors are content too. No public company exhibitor is welcome in our conference if their shares are not owned by the conference sponsors. As I've said on your show before, sadly, there's no guarantee that because I buy a stock, it goes up. But there is a guarantee that I know the company well enough that I'm willing to invest my own money in it. And that's the qualification to be an issuer exhibitor at the conference. Finally, final selling point. Uh, any educational product sponsored by Rural Investment Media, including conference tuitions, comes with an absolutely gold-plated refund. If you don't think that the lessons that you learned as a consequence of attending the conference virtually uh, or physically uh, justified the tuition that you paid me, email me and I'll give you your money back. <laughs> Now, mercifully, I've had to refund about one-tenth of one percent <laughs> of the uh, uh, conference tuitions I've charged uh, over the last 30 years. But nonetheless, if you feel for any reason that I didn't deliver you full value, email me and I'll refund your tuition. And in the past, we've always asked whether you want to re-up your offer to rank portfolios, natural resource portfolios of our viewers for free. What do you say? Absolutely. I've learned so much doing it. Dunnigan, in the last five years, I've reviewed 80,000 portfolios. The offer goes like this. If you like what I have to say about natural resources and you want to make it personal, uh, visit my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks. One more time, please no tech stocks. Please no crypto. Please no pot stocks. Natural resource stocks. I'll rank them personally, one to ten, one being best, ten being worst. I will comment on individual issues where I think my comments might have value. In addition to that, in the question and comment section below the rankings drop down, uh, if your relationship with your current bank is suboptimal, <laughs> if you think that a bank ought to recognize that your money is in fact your money, uh, write bank uh, and I will put you on the waiting list for battle bank, uh, battle being uh, uh, a suggestion that we will battle for your business or battle for better banking. So, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, rankings, bank. And I look forward to seeing as many uh, of you as possible, uh, either attending live or attending uh, virtually uh, the Rule Symposium. And one more reminder to everyone, I'd look forward to seeing you in person as well as uh, Rick does. And if you want to attend, whether in person or 
100% remote and virtual, just look in the description of this video and you'll see a link that will get you uh, right to the registration page. You can do it very quickly and I hope, hope you'll be there in person, but if you can't, at least be there online so that we can share information with you. Um, and uh, Rick, as always, just on behalf of all of our viewers, thanks for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Well, a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to engage in a discussion with your uh, uh, readers. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, Metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.